Well, good morning, First Burleson. It is wonderful to see you today. Would you stand with us as we worship our one true King?
Thanks, Michael. Hey, everybody. Welcome to church. Uh, if you're new, that usually doesn't happen. I just want to reassure you for that, but we just wanted to express our deep gratitude to the 200 of you who came out and volunteered for BBS, for the 350 kids that showed up for that week, and the 70 of them who made first-time decisions to follow Jesus. Can we give it up for what God did over BBS weekend? Absolutely incredible. So thanks for coming out, for helping set up, for leading small groups and crafts and helping us tear down the mess that was made at the campus over the week. It was an incredible time here at First Burleson during BBS. And we're so thankful to all of you who made it happen and for the generosity of our church to allow us to do that event for free to anyone, any kid in our community who wanted to come and have fun and learn about Jesus. And if you are one of our new people today, we want to extend a very special welcome to you. There's usually not confetti on Sundays, but we always have something that is worth celebrating here. We are all about two things, pursuing Christ and loving people. And everything that we do, whether we're shooting off confetti, having BBS, or it's a normal weekend service for us, that is what we are trying to accomplish. And my hope today is to get everyone connected to the things that are happening and the life of our church. And so on the screen, you're gonna see a QR code. If you scan that with your phone, you'll find out all kinds of helpful information. For our new people, you'll see a connect card on there. If you fill that out, hand it in, uh, turn it in online, uh, that will get us connected to you and give us an opportunity to reach out to you later this week. And a couple other things that we have for you today. Uh, first, we wanna pause because we recognize that this is a special weekend. This is 4th of July weekend uh, for all of us. And so um, I want to take a moment for us to recognize those who are serving and who have served before. So if that is you, if you're a veteran or if you're actively serving, would you please uh, stand up so we could recognize you today, this week, in this special weekend. Thank you, thank you so much for your service to our country. Now with the rest of you, please stand up and tell somebody next to you, it is great to see you today.
children, you hear your children now. Yes, you are the same God. You are the same God. You answered prayers back then, and you still answer now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You heard your children. for that truth today. He's the same. The weight of my sin, the depth of my shame, oh Jesus, I love. Before you I lay all of my burdens down. And with my hands lifted high, I will see. Yes, every idol I throw at your feet. Oh, this is surrender. It's my forever, amen. And with your blood, Jesus, you. my forever amen and 
2017 uh, was probably the most difficult year of my entire life. This is kind of the story behind this song. I don't even think I've ever told this, but I feel led to tell it this morning. Um, 2017, in January, I woke up in my room and uh, I couldn't leave my room. I had so much anxiety, so many thoughts going through my head that I couldn't seem to turn the doorknob to leave the room. And I had never experienced anxiety before. I didn't even know what that meant, and um, that day it was real to me. And uh, so I did only what I knew to do, which was to go grab my Bible and to read the scriptures and to remind myself who I was in Jesus. And um, that started to give me comfort and give me boldness, um, but I still really struggled. Um, while I made it out of that room, I had difficult going to grocery stores, public places, just because I had this crippling anxiety. And if you've ever experienced that, you kind of probably understand a little bit of these feelings that I'm talking about. And so I, I began to reach out to pastors who had poured into my life, mentors who had, who had discipled me. And uh, they began to just remind me of what the scripture said about who I was in Jesus. And um, while I found much comfort in God's word, um, I wrestled really difficult, uh, had a difficult journey, um, still going to those public places. And so 
pastor friend recommended, he said, man, Michael, you know, it might be good to go see a counselor. It might be good to go talk to somebody about this who's given their life to understanding the brain. And can I just stop and say that it's okay to ask for help? That it's okay to go see a counselor and talk to somebody who fully has, has given their life to understanding how the body works. And to sit with somebody, help them process through Maybe some things that happened in our childhood that we don't even remember. I remember processing that with a counselor and I started to get better with God's word, with counseling, with a biblical counselor. And I started to be able to go into these public places again. I started, to, I remember probably the most difficult memory is hearing my daughter and my wife in the other room, but I couldn't go out there because I was just so scared. And I think those of us who have anxiety, sometimes we don't even know what we're scared of. What I'd love to tell you is that I've never had anxiety again. That's just not how God wrote my story. I'd love to tell you that. I'd, lo I'd love to say that I never had it again. But I still struggle with anxiety. I still do. But the good news that I have for you is that I'm not locked in that room anymore. It said I'm right here. I'm a dad. I'm a husband. I'm not, I'm not a perfect one. I make mistakes every single day. But I tell you that story, this song came out of that story. That bridge says, I don't have to run and hide anymore. That's all I was doing because I didn't know what was going on. And I think many of us could have, probably understand that. When life seems to throw us things that we don't understand, we want to run from God because we're trying to figure it out. He wants us to run to Him. He has every answer. Healing is in His name. That's who He is. He is peace. He is love. He is joy. We can't find those things on earth. We can only find those things in Him. We can only be made whole in Him. So I stand here today as someone who, who struggles with anxiety. And if that's you, it's okay to ask for help today. The other thing that it's okay to do is that it's okay to run to God. He is our peace. I found a lot of comfort in this old hymn. We can just sing this and then we'll close. I'm getting into Ronnie's time, I'm sorry. Let's sing this together. I surrender all. And I surrender all. All to thee. Oh, I surrender all. And all to thee, my blessed Savior. Yes, I surrender all. Come on, every fear today. Surrender Oh, I surrender In all to Thee, my blessed Savior, yes, I surrender God, I thank You for this time of worship today. I thank you that while on this side of heaven we may still struggle with certain things, that we are not alone in those struggles, that you most of all are with us. And God, I'm thankful that you have given us a church family, that you've given us small groups to be a part of, to encourage us in our faith, to encourage us in Christ. Just like those men came into my life to encourage me and remind me of who I was, God, I'm so grateful that each one of us has a church home that we can be reminded of who we are when life seems to not make sense. God, thank you for bringing clarity. I pray for the person who came in just wrestling today. Maybe they've been without a job for a long time. Maybe their marriage has been struggling and they don't know if it's gonna make it. God, we know that you are the healer of all things and that you do redeem what you allow as we've heard said many times in this church. We stand on that truth this morning, that you will redeem what you allow, no matter what we're facing. Thank you for this sweet time of worship. Would you continue to speak to us as we open the scriptures? We would leave looking more like you today. We love you too. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. life. In the depths of our souls, we yearn for a greater purpose. 
We find it when we open our hearts to something beyond ourselves. Along the way, we encounter fellow travelers. Let us invest our time, our care, and our resources into their lives, enriching not only theirs, but our own. Life becomes vibrant when we share it with like-minded souls, finding strength and encouragement in the company of those who share your faith. As we journey through life, let us engage the culture, making a positive impact on the world around us, radiate goodness, kindness, and compassion. And amidst it all, we find solace and inspiration within a loving community. Life, it's like a beautiful tapestry woven with love, sacrifice, friendship, and a shared sense of purpose. Hi there. How are you? Hey, it is good to have Michael Glenn back, is it not? Yes. Thank you, Michael. Um, in case you didn't know, he was away all month. I mean, he was here a couple of Sundays, but he was away all month in at Fuge Camp leading worship for different camps that would come through. Uh, and so grateful he got to do that, but grateful to have him back. And I knew that 317 wrote that song. I didn't, I didn't know the story about it. It's the first time I've heard that. There you go. So drop the mic. So uh, <laughs> I, I love these concrete floors. Um, sorry, distracted. Michael Glenn, thank you. Okay. Um, well, I mean, what a great song. And now to know the story behind it, uh, that's, that's really cool. And it definitely connects to what we want to talk about today. Uh, so I'm glad that you're here. Uh, before I get to that, um, if you're a member here, 18 years old and above, you should have received an email from me this week. And the email is talking about just very surface level what's kind of going on with the Southern Baptist Convention. I shared a little bit last Sunday. I didn't get into the weeds with this email. I just wanted to start the conversation. And so I've already received several emails, phone calls, and texts. And I would encourage you, if you have questions about that, uh, call me. Let's talk about it. Um, whatever our church does in response, whatever that looks like, whenever that happens, it doesn't have to be immediate. But... It is something we need to talk about and, and kind of where we see maybe the Southern Baptist Convention going. Whatever we decide to do formally, just know this. It will be discussed with our leadership. It will be discussed as a church as a whole, and we will, we will do this together, okay? We may not all like it. We may not all agree, but we will do this together as a family as we proceed forward. So I hope that calms some nerves. Maybe they're kind of curious about what's going to happen, and, and I don't know what's going to happen. But it's something we do need to talk about, and we will set up ways that we can talk about it. But in the meantime, uh, if you'll just ask me, I'd be happy to sit down, let you buy me some coffee, and we'll talk about it, okay? Or lunch, if you want to go deeper. We'll get even better. So, you know, it is an important issue, and we'd love to talk to you about it more. Uh, this Sunday, we are starting a new series. Oh, first of all, do you, you love the backdrop back here? Isn't that cool? Isn't that awesome? Last week, there was a big poster of VBS. Uh, and so Luke Bird and his team built this and did our stage design. He's our production guy now, and so did a great job, and it'll look like this way for a while until Luke decides to change it, right? So it's pretty cool. Um, but anyway, we're starting this series called Life. Now, if you know anything about our church, if you remember here, if you've gone through our new members workshop, our Discover First, you've heard about life, L-I-F-E is the acrostic that we use for our disciple-making strategy. One of the things that you learn about us in that workshop and as you grow as a member is our mission is the same as every church, to love God, love people, to carry the message of the gospel, the NGO, the great commandment, the great commission, right? We, every church has that mission. Every church has a different vision how to fulfill that mission. Our vision is to be a multi-generational, multi-site, multi-venue, regional equipping church. So that's how we carry out that mission that God has given us. So inside of that, what we expect from all of our members to help us accomplish the vision that reaches the mission is our life strategy. So what we expect from you as a member of First Burleson is that you love God, and there's different ways that we express that, that you invest in people, and that's financially, through giving of our tithes and offerings. It's also relationally. It's also with our times. A time, our abilities, right? In fact, next Sunday, we'll talk about the I in our life piece. And next Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock, we're going to have a free seminar on how you can make a will. 
and you can actually leave. It's just from 2 to 3 here in the commons next Sunday afternoon. From 2 to 3, we'll walk you through the process, and you can leave with a will made out, okay? You know what a will is, right? Because the truth is we're all going to die. That's the good news, <laughs> unless Jesus comes back. Okay, we got that, but we're all going to die. So we want to be prepared spiritually. Obviously, that's what we talk about most of the time. But we also want to be prepared financially and for our family, those who we will leave behind. Even with our church, legacy giving, there's all a part of that. So if you don't have a will, you need a will. And this, this one-hour conference will help you accomplish that goal next Sunday. So I hope you can make it here. It's for all ages to be there. And then F is fellowship with believers. Is E is engage the culture. So that's what we expect of all of our people. Again, there's different levels in accomplishing those goals. But if you want to know our strategy for making disciples, carrying out the Great Commission, it's our life piece. So today we're going to talk about loving God. What does that look like? What does that mean? How does that apply to my life? How does that impact my life? So we're going to talk about life, starting with love God. So a few years ago, many years ago actually, uh, Robin and I and our kids, our kids were little, and we were in New York City. We love to go to New York City. Uh, we love the hustle and bustle and all the cool stuff that's there. Been there eight or nine times. And so we were there, and this was before GPS. You guys remember way back then? Uh, and so we were looking at things to do. We had our agenda planned out. It was the afternoon. It was kind of, kind of getting late, around 3 o'clock, 3.30. And we saw that St. John the Cathedral, St. John the Divine Cathedral, was down kind of south Manhattan, actually just right on the edge of Harlem. And so that's, I wanted to go see that, what a cool cathedral. And so we had to hurry because we're going to run out of time. It closes at 5. So we got on the subway, and we didn't have GPS, had not been uh, invented or not for public con uh, use. And so we had what, what they used to have was a paper map. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of those. I don't think they make them anymore. I think one's in the Smithsonian. But there was a paper map, right? So we're looking at the subway trip and all that kind of stuff, how we got to get. And so it's just, it's interesting. On this subway car, uh, it's just my family, and there's one other gentleman standing there. And so we're going down. Obviously, we're tourists. I mean, we all had fanny packs on, so it was kind of obvious. And so he just says, uh, hey, can I, can I help you guys get to where you're headed? Yeah, man, that'd be great. So we're trying to get to St. John the Divine. He said, okay, well, you get off the subway, you go up here, you take a left up these stairs, you get on this street, take a right. So, okay, 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 I got it, I got it. And so immediately we step off the train car and we go the wrong way. Like, so we're not very good at this. And so the man steps off at the same time and he goes, hey, why don't I walk with you? Why don't you just follow me and I'll take you to where you're going? And he did and we got to experience it. We got there in time and it was just an awesome experience. But just thinking about that, it, oftentimes in life, right, we find ourselves at an intersection or on a track or on a crossroads, a big decision to make. There's something happening in our life. We need to take a step one direction. There's options out in front of us. Don't you wish there was a GPS for life decisions? Don't you wish you could just get on your app and, and ask the question and Siri tells you what to do, right? I, it, today, if I was looking for St. John, I could do that. Hey, Siri, where's St. John the Divine? It would tell me. We didn't have that. It would be great if we had a life GPS. But what's even better, what we discovered on that trip, it was better to have someone who knows where to go take us where to go. Right? So that's God. Right? As we think about loving God, we understand that with these decisions that come, and you might be in a decision right now. But if you're not, one's coming. Right? It's just the nature of life. So doesn't it make more sense to follow the one who knows where to go, who sees it all at one time, who's been there, who's lived it? As Michael talks about anxiety, who, who understands anxiety and depression. He understands how we're wired, how we're made. To talk to Jesus who experienced everything that you and I experienced, every temptation but didn't sin. It just makes sense that we would talk to our personal GPS about the decisions that are in front of us, but how often do we do that? If you're like me, I usually tend to try to figure out on my own. I mean, I'm a grown human person. Surely by now I've got this stuff figured out, right? So that's the tendency. Well, on that subway car that day, we didn't know this man from Adam, right? He could have taken us down a dark alley. We had no idea, but he looked trustworthy. The good news about life, we know God. We know that he's trustworthy. We know that he's faithful. Now, 
he may take us down a difficult road, but it's for his purpose. There are sometimes he leads us through difficult experiences, right? But it's all for our development, for our training. So we become more like his, more like Jesus, right? We, in fact, I, I have experienced in Christianity that usually the right way is not the easy way. <laughs> Does it seem like that for you? It seems like the way that I'm supposed to go it always seems a more difficult way. So I just started choosing the more difficult way, just <laughs> assuming that's what God has in store for me. And, and oftentimes I make a wrong turn, just like on that subway. I headed the wrong way. I do that often in life. But that's the beauty of God. He is great about course correcting. So even then, it's not dependent on me getting it right and perfect all the time. When I don't get it right, he's still gracious and loving and forgiving. And he, you know, gently taps me on the shoulder or sometimes yells in my ear, hey, Ron, you headed the wrong way. Let's go the way I told you. Because sometimes I just don't listen. Or sometimes I, I think I'm big enough to do it my own way. I know I'm the only one in the room that does that, but that's a lot of times I face. Because asking that question, where am I going? Where is my life going? Where is my marriage going? Where is my family going? Where is my career going? Where is our church going? Right? These are constant questions that plague us every day. And every decision we make, every day is filled with multiple decisions. And some of them impact this direction that we're having. And that can be overwhelming. That can cause anxiety. That can cause depression. It can cause fear and worry. And so the Bible gives us really kind of a formula. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this. He was a lecturer on Christology, what we believe about Christ. He said this, Theology must give priority to the question of who over how, and that the best and most proper way to understand how must be determined in light of who. So our tendency in these moments of decision is to focus on the how to make the decision rather than the who who will help us make the right decision. I think that's, I know that's my tendency, right? I want to focus on, okay, what's my strategy? What's my plan? What do I need to do to, to make the right choice here rather than stopping and asking the one who knows? In those moments of decision, crossroad, intersection, crisis, it's important that we focus on the who more than the how. The how is important, but we learn the how when we focus on the who. But honestly, most of us are too busy to stop and focus on him. So if you have your Bible, I invite you to open to Psalm 96. Because knowing the who helps impact the direction of our lives. In big decisions and in little decisions. I think all of us want to change the world, right? That's, that's our challenge. We want, we want to change the world. We want our kids, our kids to change the world. Right? You do this, you can change the world. Changing the world really is more about God than about us. But the beauty about this is God has a plan, an eternal plan. He's invited us to play a part that he's created us to play. So God is changing the world. God is drawing people to himself. We have 70 kids making a first-time decision for Christ with VBS. That's God. But the cool thing is God used volunteers and staff to make that happen. So that's the joy that we get in being a part of the eternal plan of God that we have a part to play. So we, we find joy and peace when we discover our role to play in his kingdom plan. We don't have to figure this out. We just have to obey. Psalm 96, this is the, the first step in, in following God is to love him. Look at verses 1 through 4, Psalm 96. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. So how we show love to God is worship. What we do here on Sunday morning. We say this all the time, but I think we have a hard time believing. This is not about us. It's really about him. And when we get that, worship becomes impactful for us because our focus is not on us. You see how that works. But worship is our witness to the glories of God, to his beauty. It is one way we respond to God continually to pour out his goodness in our life. 
God continually, lavishly pours his love, his goodness, forgiveness, healing, presence into our life. And so worship should be a continual outpouring from us. Worship is more than what happens on Sunday morning. It's more than singing Jesus songs in your car. It really is a lifestyle. The Bible says the way you eat and drink, the way you relate, it all can bring glory to God. Every aspect of our life can bring glory to God, is an act of worship. When we are living the life God called us to live, when we're behaving righteously, living a holy life, this is all worship to God. So it is a lifestyle. There, there is no way to exhaust the list of reasons to worship God. Have you ever discovered a new reason to worship God? A lot of times we discover a new reason through a time of take vacation. In, you know, if we love the mountains, we typically go to the mountains. We love the beach, we go to the beach. We go to New York City if you love the city. So we, there's just things that, that God has created we love to be around. Right? They bring joy. They bring peace. It's just a, a breath of fresh air for us. And all that beauty that we see and experience that God wants us to experience, we are the best of all creation. There is nothing else created in the image of God, only people. That is where we find our significance. That is where we find our meaning and our purpose, why we were created, why we're here. That also leads us to want to worship him. Worship should be a natural response when we understand God in a deeper way. It should be overwhelming. Like Isaiah in the temple, when God showed up, it should drive us to our knees. We are not worthy for him to care one ounce about us. But his desire is to have a relationship with you. He doesn't need our worship, but he desires our worship. That's part of our relationship and understanding him. So the psalmist here writes, sing to the Lord a new song. It's interesting that the first time that Singing a song is mentioned in the Bible is Exodus 15 when God delivered his people out of Egypt. The last time singing a song is mentioned is Revelation 15, the last book of the Bible, when God completely redeems his people. It's interesting, the beginning and the end was song. Listen, singing is important. Singing does something to our brain. It does something to our spirit. It does something to our heart. In unseen ways, it connects us closer together as a family. Sing a new song. There's a, there's a new reason. His mercies are new every morning. There's a new reason every day. There's a new discovery every day of why I should sing to the Lord. It's a natural expression. Sometimes there's a song out there that just expresses what we've been trying to say all along, but we haven't been able to put it in words. Have you ever done that? Some of the songs we sing today, like it's like, Man, that's exactly what I'm feeling. That's exactly what I want to say. I just, I just couldn't put those words together. That's why God creates songwriters. He gives people songs that we can sing. Not all of us are songwriters. I'm grateful for 317 Collective. They're great songwriters. And we get to sing those. And, and it's cool how the Holy Spirit connects that to our heart. Right? Yeah, that's, that's exactly how I feel. That's exactly how, how I wanted to express my love for God. And they put it into words for us. That's the, that's the beauty of how the Spirit works. It also, when we sing together, it unites us together, right? Especially for those of us like me who can't sing very well, we rely on those of you who can to be really loud so I can sing and not be embarrassed, right? So sing your heart out. I need you to, right? And you're going to want to if you hear me sing, right? So that's just somehow we're, we're serving one another in that sense. What I don't understand <laughs> is how a Christ follower can be in a worship service in the midst of worship and not sing. Just stare. How do you do that? It's like all serious, right? I'm too macho to sing. I'm not going to sing. Don't make me sing. You can't make me sing. Right? It's like the Clint Eastwood style of worship. I feel lucky, punk. Go ahead. Make me worship. Like, what's wrong with you? You're in the presence of the Almighty God. I don't care if you can't sing, right? You like it when your kids sing? You like your kid, when your kids express love to you? Do you care about how good of a singer they are? No. How much more is the Father? You should sing. 
singing. Somebody's written the words for you to express what's on your heart. Let it out. God loves that. As a parent, don't you love it? As a grandparent, don't you love it? Man, we have a reason to sing. Worship is a choice. Try this discipline, okay? Start, start doing this every day. It's very simple. When you wake up in the morning, as soon as you tell Alexa to stop with the alarm, think about something about the greatness of God. Before you think about, did the coffee turn on? Did I set the timer? Before you think about, am I late? Just, just pause for a minute before you roll out of bed and just think about some aspect of the greatness of God. See how that sets the trajectory for your day. And then at night, when you're about to fade off to sleep, let the last entertainment thought of your mind be about the greatness of God. Let's begin our day and end our day focused on the greatness of God. Let's take captive every thought and let's put our thought in the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega of the day, let's put it on the alpha and omega of all things. And let's see. Let's see how it impacts your dreams. Let's see how it impacts how you wake up. Let's see how it impacts your day. It's beginning and ending, acknowledging that you are in the presence of the holy God. That has to have impact. And what that's going to do is going to lead you to worship all day long, thinking about him. The greatness of our God is a reason we worship and witness and we share what God is doing in our lives. Look at verse 5. He goes on. For all the gods of all the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory, do his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. You know when David wrote this song? It's when the Ark of the Covenant was returned back to Jerusalem. Throughout the Old Testament, remember before the temple was built, they lived in a in tabernacle, they lived in tents. As they wandered toward the promised lands, they wandered through the wilderness, they had tents. And so the church was a tabernacle. And there in the Holy of Holies contained the Ark of the Covenant, which represented the power and the presence of God. Well, enemies had stolen the Ark, and David was able to rescue it and bring it back. And it was a moment of celebration. It was a powerful moment because he knew the significance of the Ark of the Covenant. He knew that it represented the power and the presence of God. He knew it was vital for Israel. Yesterday, Rob and I saw the the last Indiana Jones movie, and and I hope that that's the last Indiana Jones movie. It was okay. It was okay. It was nostalgic because I was alive when the first one came out back in 1981, and I remember that one. That was a great one, maybe the best one. But you remember that movie, and they were trying to find the Ark of the Covenant Uh, because even back then, Nazi Germany, thought this would give us power and strength to rule the world. I mean, that's not true, but they were connecting through the Old Testament to realizing the importance of the the Ark of the Covenant. So David gets that back. So he writes this song. And notice the first thing he does to celebrate, he sings to the Lord. The first response of God's presence was for him to worship and to lead the people in worship. That should be our response when we acknowledge and recognize the presence of our holy God. We should worship Him. How do we worship Him? We worship Him in spirit and in truth. We worship Him with our hearts. It is an emotional thing, but it's also an intellectual thing. We worship Him with our minds. God has spoken to our intellect to allow us to believe in His existence and to understand His attributes and His character. Uh, In John chapter 4, You know this story where Jesus meets a Samaritan woman by the well. And he's telling her about her life and how many husbands she's had and that she's living with a guy now. And she's a Samaritan and he's a Jew, which they don't, a guy never talked to a woman he wasn't married to in public, especially a Jew didn't talk to a Samaritan. So he's breaking all kind of cultural norms. And so she kind of tries to divert the discussion talking about theology, about God and about worship. And then Jesus makes this statement which is really kind of puzzling. It's kind of interesting statement. In chapter 4, verse 23, Jesus says this. 
Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshiper the Father seeks. And so that leads to the question, okay, what does it mean to worship God in spirit and in truth? Well, to break that down, to worship him in truth is Jesus. Jesus is truth. Right, So what we know about Jesus, what we understand about God, what you've experienced about God, what you've learned about God to this very point is truth. And in spirit, we have a spiritual dimension, the spirit of God. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He lives within us. He leads us in this time of worship. So it's, it's our spirit worshiping the Holy Spirit. It's our lives. It's our mind. It's our heart worshiping God. And we worship him in truth. If you're at an intersection of life, if you're at a crossroads of a big decision, if you're in the middle of a crisis, as Michael said when he was going through that time of hurting, one of the things that he was encouraged to do is remember what you know about God already. When you doubt, is God even hearing my prayers? It's important that you remember what you already know to be true about God. That leads us to worship. We may not understand all about God. We may not even like what God does, but we know that he is faithful and trustworthy. Amen? It's, it's interesting. Some of the songs that we sing, from, sometimes there's a verse to this effect of God, you never let me down. You never disappoint me. That's backwards. That should never be a question. That's not the issue. We're the issue. Do we listen and obey? That's the issue. God's always faithful. That's always going to be. It's not about him letting me down. It's about me letting him down. I don't even have to say that because I know that's true about God. I mean, we've, we've walked through enough stuff by now, right? You've been in the wilderness before to know that dry feeling, that anxious feeling. And then you remember how he brought you out. He's going to do that again. He's going to do that again. It may not be the way you like it, but he's going to do that again. You know that. Again, that battle still rages. I appreciate Michael's honesty. I, I, I'm with him. I still do things wrong. I still choose my own way. And I went to seminary. <laughs> I know that doesn't mean anything. Worship should be deliberately theological. Deliberately what you believe about God, what you know about him, is true. And we worship him in truth. Sometimes we are tempted, even in coming in worship, and, and I love that this kind of looks like a sanctuary out of this passage, the sanctuary. All of creation is God's sanctuary. We can worship him at any time, any place, any way, right? So it's, we're always in his presence, always in his sanctuary, always a need to worship. Sometimes our temptation is to think that worship is about behavior modification. If I, if I love God, then, then I just I need to change some of these things. And, and maybe we do, for sure. But that's not where we start. The first start is knowing him. The first step is to know him more, right? So Robin and I, for about a year now, have been praying about something that the Lord has kind of placed on our heart. And so we've been praying together, and, and we haven't received a yes, and we haven't received a no. What I sense is receiving from God is just wait. He will answer. He promises. He hears. He answers. But those are the responses we get. Yes, no, or just wait. Wait on me. I hate that time. <laughs> right? I hate the waiting. Uh, and so my tendency is in that time trying to get God to answer me, then, okay, God, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read through the whole Old Testament this time, right? God, I'm going I'm to add five more minutes to my prayer. Okay, God, Robin and I are going to study C.S. Lewis together, right? So let, we'll do that, uh, and then you'll give us an answer, right? So if, if we do this, God, if, if, I, if I do more religious stuff, then that will speed you up. In some sense, we try to manipulate God with our good works. Have you done that? It's almost like we flash back to the ancient Greco-Roman world where 
the Greeks and the Romans had all these gods, and all they tried to do were appease all these gods. And somehow that's how we start to think as a Christ follower. Well, I need to do all this to appease God so that he'll give me the answer that I want. Or at least he'll say something. It's not the way this works. <laughs> it's not about doing more stuff. It's about realizing who you are in him and standing on the truth of what you know about him. I know it's a tough time. Waiting is tough. But it's not wasted. All that time in the wilderness for the Israelites before they got to go in the promised land, those 40 years, because 10 of the spies said they couldn't go in and two said that they could. Joshua and Caleb, that was a development time for them. Joshua ended, ended up taking over. That wilderness you're in, it's not a waste of time. God doesn't waste a second of our lives. He doesn't waste a second of our encounter with him. This is a vital time for you. There are times God needs us to be in the wilderness because he's developing us for what he's about to take us to do. That's a hard time. It's a time of remembrance. It's one of the reasons the Israelites have so many festivals and feasts is to remember God, which empowers us to go forward. But I will say this to you also. There are times when you find yourselves at the crossroads or the intersection of life, what you need to do is just stop. Again, we're in a highly moving society, right? And we feel bad if we're not moving. We feel guilty for resting. And sometimes God says, I just need you to be still. Just be quiet and wait for me. I have something for you that you won't believe. I have something for you that if you tried to do it, you would totally mess it up. So just be still. Some of us are there right now. We have a major decision to make in our life. We're at that crossroads, and it's scary because there are a lot of options out there. So is this my will or is it God's will? Right? We ask that question all the time. In those moments when you don't know where to go, that's okay. Just be still. And sometimes he will yell at you in the thunder. And sometimes he'll whisper to you through a little child of what you're to do next. But don't feel pressure to run out ahead. It is okay to wait. And in that moment, Worship God. That's the true test, right? When we're in the storm, we're at the crossroads. That's a true test of our worship. Is it really in truth? Is it really in spirit? How do we handle it in the difficult times? What you know to be true about God, it enables us to worship him even in the storm. So again, if, if you're in the storm, if you're in the crossroads, you don't know what to do, follow David's advice. Just worship just seek the Lord. Read his word. Spend time talking to him. Surround yourself with other believers. Sing Christian songs. Immerse yourself, right? So here's the challenge I have for all of us. That we will attend Sunday morning worship regularly. In our life piece, that's one of the steps that you can take to, to deepen your love with God. Spend time in Sunday morning worship. Again, we need this. God doesn't need our worship, but he desires our worship. There's something that happens when we're together as a family worshiping our Father. It's supernatural. You may not always see it or feel it, but it's happening, right? That's why the Bible tells us to do this. And, and I'll let you define what regular is, okay? <laughs> that, when I was growing up, that was every Sunday, every Sunday night, every Wednesday, yeah, that's not the case anymore, and that's fine. That's cool. Whatever's regular is for you, just do that, okay? Just show up in worship. And come into worship, not asking what's in this for me, but asking God what he wants from you. Let our focus be on him. We'll get the blessings for doing that. And he'll be very live and real for us, but 
let's not get caught up in worship being about us, what I like and what I don't like. Let's really let it be about him. Let's pray. God, thank you for loving us first. Thank you for hunting us down and revealing how amazing you are and revealing that you want a personal relationship with each of us, a thriving relationship, a growing relationship. And God, is these next four weeks as we talk about how we become deeper disciples, how we can follow you better. I pray that you would show each of us that next step for us. For some, it may be to join this fellowship. They don't have a church home and they need one. For some, God, it may be that they need to ask Jesus to be the leader and forgiver of their lives. For some, Father, it may be that they need to quit running away from you because that's just impossible. For some, it may be that they need to confess and repent of their sin. Or some may need to talk to a professional counselor. You know what we need to do. And I pray that you would just, in these next few moments, just unleash your Holy Spirit to challenge us, to convict us, to comfort us, to console us, to give us the courage to do what you've called us to do. Above all, Father, we worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As we get ready to leave today, I want to encourage you, if you need prayer for anything this morning, come down to the front. We'd love to pray for you. If you want to be by yourself, you can come out here and just kneel down. Maybe you want to reach out to one of the pastors on staff. You can go to our website, get our information, stop by the info center, pick up a card. We would love to connect with you. If you have questions, you need prayer, whatever it is, we'd love to talk to you today or sometime this week. Uh, one thing I want to tell you about that's happening next Sunday at 2 p.m. Uh, in the Commons, which is our main lobby space right outside the worship center here, we're going to have a will workshop prepping for the end of life. Uh, so if that is something that is of interest to you, it's going to be absolutely free starting at 2 p.m. This is not uh, something for a, a particular demographic. This is any adult. If you have not prepared that stuff for you, whether you're just entering into adulthood or maybe you're in the later stages of life, everyone needs to have their will set out. So I would love for you to come out to that if that's something that is uh, you need um, for your life right now. First Burleson, I hope you have a safe and wonderful 4th of July week. We will see you next Sunday. See how they built that oh, thing.